Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bob Colmar. Uh, he has 37, a wide range of experience, 37 years in the railway industry. He's currently Executive Director of Engineering Communications and Train Control at the Association of American Railroads. Um, he's worked uh, as Chief Engineering Officer uh, for the New Orleans Public Belt Railroad. He's worked at Amtrak as General Superintendent for West Operations and VP for Engineering Initiatives and Strategic Planning. We were talking earlier, it's probably one of the most varied backgrounds in the rail industry from finance to strategic planning to operations and engineering. Uh, so I think he's going to give us a lot of good insight today. Uh, Bob uh, has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Tri-State University, which is now Trine University. I guess about four or five years ago they changed their name. And he's also got, work, uh, got some uh, academic experience at Drexel University on his finance side of things. So Bob, we're happy to have you here today and we look forward to your talk. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, thank you, Dr. Larry, for putting this on. What a wonderful forum this is for all of us to be able to exchange ideas. And that's what we'd like to do today. Just have some fun. We're going to try to talk about three different things primarily. The first is the alphabet soup in Washington and try to get some of the different associations and what it is that we do and why we do what we do. We're going to talk about a little bit about the Association of American Railroads and then we're going to talk about positive train control. So sit back and enjoy the trip with us. I've seen that a thousand times and every time it excites me. So it's really a delight to be able to share it with you. Well, let's talk about what is the difference between a railroad, APTA, FRA, NTSB, ARIMA, and the AAR. There are several different yet interrelated organizations which provide a myriad of different services to the railroad industry. We're going to teach a little bit today about the differences between standards, specifications, recommended practices, established and enforced regulations regarding train speeds, track, signals, grade crossing, and inspections, who provides fines for non-compliance, who maintains interchange data for all railroads and notifies railroads about non-compliant freight cars, who investigates accidents and makes safety recommendations, who provides technical recommendations and standard plans for railroads, who serves as the advocacy organization for the freight rail industry, and then we're going to talk a little bit about talent base of active railroad managers. A railroad, what is it a railroad does? Its mission is to provide safe and efficient transportation at a reasonable cost. Their mission is also to develop customers, to service online industry, to interchange or exchange freight cars with other railroads. They have to work with stakeholders to develop economic growth throughout their corridors and throughout the United States. They develop their own standards and recommended practices and they, or they use industry recommended practices within their systems. And their managers that we're going to talk about today also volunteer to serve on AAR and ARIMA committees, whatever they are. And also a railroad makes money. That's the key difference between the railroad and everyone else. Some folks have heard of APTA, the American Public Transportation Administration Association in Washington. Its vision statement says they are the leading force in advancing public transportation. But their mission is to strengthen and support and improve public transportation. APTA serves and leads its diverse membership through advocacy, innovation, and information sharing. And its members work 
to ensure that public transportation is available and accessible for all Americans and communities throughout the country. So APTA primarily deals with public transit and public transportation. The Federal Railroad Administration, or the FRA, they're, in, they're entrusted to promulgate and enforce rail safety regulations. They administer railroad assistance programs, that's financial assistance. They conduct research and develop in support of improved railroad safety and a national railroad transportation policy. They fund the Northeast Corridor Passenger Service. And they consolidate government support of many rail transportation activities. They are headquartered in Washington, D.C., and they have offices strategically placed throughout the United States. They are a part of the United States Department of Transportation. The National Transportation Station Safety Board. Now, sometimes you hear their name mentioned whenever there's a large disaster, a safety issue. But they are charged with investigating every civil aviation accident in the United States, and especially significant accidents in other modes of transportation. With us, it's, it's railroad. So when we have a major passenger train derailment, or even a major freight train derailment, they will be involved in helping determine the probable cause of the accident and issue, they will issue a safety recommendation aimed at preventing future accidents. They are also headquartered in Washington, D.C. with offices throughout the United States, and they are an independent federal agency. We all heard of ARIMA. ARIMA is the American Railway Engineering and Maintenance Away Association. What are they? They're charged with the development and advancement of both technical and practical knowledge and recommended practices pertaining to the design, construction, and maintenance of railway infrastructure, a very, very important group. They also develop and maintain volumes of recommended practices, which I encourage you to take a look at. Also, they develop a portfolio of standard plans, and those plans really deal with track work and railroad infrastructure. The technical committees are comprised of the entire railroad industry, managers, suppliers, and consultants, and academia. And I urge you, if you become a member of a railroad industry profession, no matter what it is, you will be a part of one of these committees. And it's up to you to determine which committee you want to be a part of. It's wide ranging, and I know you'll have fun. We need your expertise. I work for the, Amer the Association of American Railroads. We are an independent trade association. We are not associated with the government. I'm not a government employee. Our customers are the seven class one railroads, Amtrak, and over 200 smaller freight railroads and commuter railroads. So we service those railroads. They are our customers. We work with elected officials and leaders in Washington, D.C on critical transportation and related issues. We ensure that the freight rail industry will continue to meet America's transportation needs today and tomorrow. And we see nothing but unparalleled growth in the freight rail industry. It's exploding and it will continue to explode in the foreseeable future. We establish the standards uh, for North Americans Railroad's rolling stock, both freight cars and locomotives, and technology and network operations. So that's one of the questions that we had at the beginning. Who establishes the standards for freight cars and locomotives? We do. We also focus on improving the safety and productivity of rail transportation throughout our own initiatives in cooperation with FRA and other associations. So yes, we work with all of our railroads, we work with the NTSB, we work with the FRA, we work with APTA, and we work with ARIMA. So it's one big, one-stop shopping place. Let's talk about the other portions of our association. To advance these goals, we use two subsidiaries, the Transportation Technology Center, which is located in Pueblo, Colorado. We're going to learn a little bit about that in a minute, and Railink. TTCI, the Transportation Technology Center, is the world's leading research and development testing facility, and we develop the next generation of advancements in safety and operation efficiency. 
Railink, our other subsidiary, serves as the rail industry's leading resource for rail data, information technology, and information services, and uses one of the largest data networks to track customer shipments. So if you can imagine all of the freight cars that interchange throughout the United States, every day continuously, we manage that data. The AAR also supports the Railroad Research Foundation. It is a world-class policy research organization dedicated to sustaining a safe and secure, technologically advanced rail network. So we have plenty of opportunities. Between these three organizations, I think there's about 500 people. The Safety and Operations Management Committee is a part of the AAR. We look across the top in the slightly shaded boxes. You can see there are a number of managerial committees, and these deal primarily with locomotives and freight cars. There's technical oversight, risk management, business services, railroad security, rail link, and uh, then we have this one in the middle called Interoperable Operations Working Committee. Most of those committees uh, I support, and these are the, all of the railroad electronics associated with the railroad industry, whether it be wireless communication or the data assimilation for moving trains, railroad signaling, communications and train control, and then we also have one other committee, positive train control policy. All of our members, railroad and uh, also uh, vendor community and suppliers, make up these committees. They work together collaboratively to continue the, uh, the research that's done and to continue to make our industry better and safer every day. Uh, in, I'd say in these committees there's probably about a membership of a thousand. So we welcome, you will also, if you're a member of a railroad, we hope that you will participate on these. You'll be selected by your managers to work on these. Let's talk a little bit about TTCI. This is the world's premier facility for rail research and testing. This is where the railroads spur innovation. Ready for brake test anytime. This is where the industry boosts safety, reliability, and efficiency. This is TTCI. The Transportation Technology Center Incorporated, TTCI, is located on the open prairie in Pueblo, Colorado. TTCI is a huge facility. It's about 52 square miles. It's about five miles wide and 10 miles long. We've got about 48 miles of track and a number of different laboratories. TTCI is a unique public-private partnership. The facility is owned by the Federal Railroad Administration, and TTCI is in turn a wholly owned subsidiary of the Association of American Railroads. TTCI is perhaps best known for its research and testing on freight rail technology. In the facility's two main laboratories, the Component Test Lab and the Rail Dynamics Lab, engineers use one-of-a-kind test machines. These machines simulate the stresses of long-time train operations in very short periods of time. It's trying to push the components to their limits in a safe environment in the lab before they ever go out onto the rails. With testing in these labs, customers receive data on the durability of components in weeks instead of years. And those time savings translate to gains in reliability and safety. All the work that we do focuses on making the railroads much safer. Anything that we can do to prevent derailments is definitely something that we love to do. In the Rail Dynamics Lab, Engineers can also test entire freight cars, not just their components. Huge 200-ton cranes lift the cars right onto a machine called the vibration test unit. You can put the entire car body on it and then run it through the basis of its dynamic environment in real life. All set to go. TTCI takes freight rail testing onto the tracks with the instrumented freight car. It's a uh, performance-based track inspection, and uh, when it runs over a piece of track, 
it tells us about the track condition. So if there's any track location that requires uh, maintenance attention, then engineers and, and maintenance personnel will be uh, notified about it. This kind of track testing can be done at TTCI or on a customer's railroad. And looking forward, TTCI is working with the railroads to test and perfect positive train control. PTC systems aim to use digital radio signals and computer programs to automatically stop trains when human error threatens a crash. What we have done here at TTCI is to build a simulated PTC system where we actually have three real locomotives equipped with PTC to see how well they will operate in a stressed environment. It's this kind of technology and the engineering talent behind it that keeps major customers returning to TTCI. Customers like TTX, North America's leading provider of rail cars. We come to TTCI to test our cars under controlled track conditions to evaluate the performance of our cars. We have a large fleet and improvements in our performance translate to cost savings for TTX and our owners. TTCI also does passenger rail research and testing. In fact, its roots are in high-speed passenger train research. In the early 1970s, the site was known as the High Speed Ground Test Center. In the late 1990s, TTCI tested Amtrak's high-speed Acela train, logging tens of thousands of miles on its test tracks. And TTCI continues to requalify the Acela's performance once a year. Today, an important focus in TTCI's passenger rail research, and in freight as well, are crashworthy cars designed to protect riders and crew. We had six sensors on the car. We had two video cameras. Got loose, 40 miles an hour. Crash energy management systems are intended to uh, dissipate the energy involved in a crash. The forces involved when the car uh, hits the barrier can be in the, in the millions of pounds. Standards for improved crashworthiness for passenger cars uh, came out of this work. Fast. It's where some of TTCI's most advanced testing takes place. Fast is the facility for accelerated service testing, and the name really says it all. The facility gives us a place where we can test rail and track components in an accelerated manner on a 2.7 mile loop. And around that loop at FAST are arrayed some of the world's most cutting edge trackside detectors. The railroad industry really has made a tremendous leap forward. It's a game changer to have these wayside devices out on the track. Railroads can essentially perform a CAT scan of the cars online without ever removing the cars from service. FAST offers a unique environment for controlled, repeatable, and secure testing of railway components. Measurement frames there. Railroads and suppliers from around the world bring their innovative technology here for developing and testing. At a different TTCI test site, a trackside detector showing great promise uses ultrasonic technology to find internal flaws in rail wheels. And the U-Rail system is a detector on the move. It uses high-energy lasers to generate ultrasonic signals that inspect rails for hidden flaws. With its technology, its people, and its mission, TTCI is... System activated. ...where the future of rail is being written. There are things being done here nobody else is doing. As far as fake technology is concerned, we are the leaders in the world. I just see this place as being the hotbed of research for the rail industry for the next 50 to 100 years to come. Many of you, if you decide to join the rail industry, will ultimately want to go to TTCI to take a look and visit and participate and share in the research. <clears throat> Almost everything that you've seen including what we're going to talk about next, did not exist when I started my railroad career. So the, the wisdom and knowledge of the senior people that are there it will be departing, and we need young people 
to fill in this gap. And we know that we have many, many bright people who are going to do that. Let's take a few minutes and talk about the largest initiative in the railroad industry today, and it's called positive train control. And let's, it's going to take a few minutes, but let's walk through it, and I think it will clearly explain what it is that we're trying to do, which is unparalleled in transportation. Positive train control is an automated, highly complex system which provides the following features. It is a communication-based system of functional requirements for monitoring and controlling train movements to provide increased safety. The system will prevent train-to-train -train collisions, whether they are overtake, train following another train head-on, head-on collision, or converging two trains from the side. It will prevent trains from exceeding speed limits, whether they be permanent speed limits, Due to the train type, one train can go faster than the other. A track geometry, which is a curve or through a turnout or a switch from one track to another. It will also enforce temporary speed limits. And this could be uh, for a track gang, a maintenance away, slow water, where we slow the track down to do construction. And it will prevent incursions into maintenance work zones so that an employee who's on the railroad can no longer be at risk by a train that should, should have stopped but didn't stop. Some positive train control systems have the ability to do grade crossings pre-start and health monitoring, but not the system that we're going to talk about today. What is it? Well, it's, it's three components, and we'll get into each of these just a little bit, but I wanted to give an overview. The three components are the office segment, which is like the train dispatcher and that crowd. There's the wayside segment, which is the physical signal location or switch location throughout the United States. And also the locomotive segment. So there's three parts and they communicate wirelessly. Interoperable Electronic Train Management System, or IETMS. This is the positive train control system that the freight carriers have elected to install. It is an overlay train control system to the nation's freight railroad existing signal system. It is designed to prevent the collisions, overspeed, civil speed enforcement, roadway workers. And it uses unique braking algorithms for both passenger trains and freight trains because they brake differently. Long coal trains that we see brake differently than the fast intermodal trains. So they all have different braking algorithms and all of these were created by industry with a lot of the work being done, of course, at TTCI. It is a GPS-based system, and this system does not use transponders. The office system, the back office server, is, is associated with the train dispatch centers. It must authenticate all of the servers, all of the systems and personnel who are using the, 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 uh, the system. It, is an interf it interfaces with numerous enhancements to the train dispatching system. It provides security application for message integrity. And we're going to talk about the messaging. And just imagine the millions of messages that are going to go on constantly that have to be secure so that no one can hack into it. It also provides an interoperable train control messaging system. We're going to talk about that. And we've developed a brand new 220 megahertz data radio for base communication. We communicate switching network and in, in interoperable back office communications. All of this is brand new. We're going to talk about the wayside locations where we saw those little signals. It, we, this system will tell us what position each turnout is in, whether it's normal or reverse. We have both integrated and standalone wayside interface units. We have wayside database uh, uh, data network now which contains over 200 characteristics of track and track side access and and this has been over 500,000 points throughout the railroad system that have been integrated into this master database. The wayside system also uses this brand new 220 megahertz data radio for both switch and signal communication. On the locomotive side we have a train management computer. This is an interactive display, and we'll show a picture of this. We have, as a part of the train management system, brand new software that was just developed. 
We also have a 220 megahertz data radio for each locomotive. And on board the locomotive, we have these computer display units, GPS sensors, crash hardened memory module, and this brand new antenna array for all data transmissions. None of this existed a few years ago. I'm not going to get into the real specifics, but if you can look at this and just imagine that all of this stuff is now new and it's on board the locomotive. So all of these new boxes had to be created. All of them are integrated and tied in. And all of them have to work together on the locomotive, plus communicate with the back office, plus communicate with the wayside signaling system. This is one of the boxes that's on board, or the electronic train management computer. It tells a little bit about all the good stuff there. It has wires that go in and out. And it's really <clears throat> one of the brains of the operation. But it's crash hardened, and it's made for a rough industrial environment. On the locomotive segment, there's a whole array of different boxes that we have, all these brand new computer things. Data radio, the trained management computer, and by God, we have to be able to talk to the locomotive engineer. So we had to develop a new locomotive engineer display unit. <clears throat> Inside the locomotive, the FRA has said that all members of the train crew will have an unobstructed view of the screen. So if you have people on both sides of the locomotive, <clears throat> they either have to be able to see one screen or we have to put in two screens. The locomotive interface gateway, another new brain that was recently developed, provides integration of PTC functionality to over 30 different existing locomotive configurations. This is all done through RF. There are 18,000 locomotives which have to be equipped. All of these locomotives have to come out of the pool and they have to go back in the pool at least twice. 18,000 locomotives represents approximately 75% of the mainline operating fleet throughout the nation. 4,000 installations have been started, and if you can imagine, with all these locomotives, about 1,700 miles of wire have to be installed and correctly configured. This is what a locomotive engineer sees when he or she sits down at the cab. The seat is just directly in front of us. On the right-hand side, that's kind of like the, the display that they look at that says, how fast am I going, and a little bit more about what my locomotive does. The, the center screen also is one of the uh, operational displays. It tells about the locomotive itself. The blue thing that you see in the lower, that's like the gas pedal. And then on the left-hand side, is this new positive train control locomotive display that the engineer is going to look at. Yeah, those buttons on the front, they're the horn and that kind of stuff also. This is a little bit about that cab display unit that we talked about. It has a lot of information built in. It is interactive with the locomotive engineer, and there's going to be a lot of training required because this is a new box on the locomotive. This is what the locomotive engineer is going to see. Up the top, you can see, we'll talk a little bit about it for a minute. It says 32 miles an hour. That's how fast the train is going. The maximum authorized speed is 49 miles an hour. If you look on the left-hand side, you'll see that white series of boxes. That's the train. The train is at mile post 17. You can see the nose of the train on the right of the little boxes, and it's proceeding towards mile post 18. It's slightly downhill right now, it's going to be going uphill, and then it has a long downgrade to the right-hand side of the screen. You'll see these two lines in front of the locomotive. The one is, the first red line is where the locomotive must stop if it has a problem. The ye next yellow line is kind of like a warning message that's going to be given to the locomotive engineer. So the locomotive engineer will be able to see the railroad that's in front of him, what it looks like, where they are with respect to the railroad. You can see that green and yellow and red bar. That's actually what the track structure looks like in front of them. You can see the signal. You can see a siding, and the siding has a red bar on it. it might be occupied by a train. And then the green bar is where they're going to operate. So there's a lot of information that's conveyed to the locomotive engineer, and this is what PTC does. Now, <coughs> the locomotive engineer is always in charge of their train. They can always operate it. 
But if they're incapacitated or they fail to react to a warning, PTC will issue a brake enforcement and it will stop the train. If the train gets too close to another train, it'll stop. If the train is entering a curb at a high rate of speed, it will stop. If the train enters a work authority, it will stop before it gets there. All of these things are predictive and will happen before the train enters a restricted area. This is some of the things that we do in the railroad industry for ourselves. This is a radio spectrum analysis of Chicago. On the right hand side is Lake Michigan, on the left hand side is throughout the metropolitan area of Chicago. You can see these little black spots in the middle of each of those red zones, those are antennas. The red field are the, the, the largest propagation of our radio frequencies. And then the yellow areas, it gets less complex and the green, finally it reaches the white area where we don't have any radio coverage. If one can imagine the millions and millions of transmissions that are gonna have to, have to occur, many of them simultaneously, that we can't interfere with the myriad, the thousands of trains that operate in Chicago. 25% of the nation's traffic moves, freight traffic moves through Chicago on a daily basis. So we had to come up with a new radio system that allowed us not only to communicate with voice communication, which is separate from the positive train control. So if you, no matter what you're into, if you're into radios or if you're into marketing or logistics or whatever, we have a role for you in the railroad industry. Well, we've talked a lot about the, the, the complexities of it, but how, how complex is it? The first sentence says it all. It is the most expensive and technically <coughs> complex initiative in railroad history. 75% of all of the locomotives, mainline locomotives will be equipped. 17,000, I'm sorry, 1,700 miles of new locomotive wiring has to be installed. 96,000 miles of railroad tracks must be equipped with positive train control. And we have mapped about half a million wayside elements. A wayside element is the beginning of a bridge the beginning of a curve, the location of a, a turnout, a grade crossing, uh, anything associated with a railroad has been mapped. 50,000 wayside units, that's these communication units at each signal will have to be installed. About 150,000 people or 75% of the entire railroad employment service today will receive training on this complex system. If one can imagine, it's not just the locomotive engineer that has to be trained on how to operate positive train control. We need our signal maintainers, their supervisors, we need the people who maintain the locomotives, we need the people who work on the tracks, all of their supervision, train dispatchers, all of these people have to understand the system before we turn it on. Today it's about an $8 billion initiative and one of the interesting things about it because it's mandated by Congress, this initiative must be internally funded by each of the freight railroads. There is no federal money or state money being given to any of the railroads for PTC. Commuter railroads are receiving some government funding. So it's what we call an unfunded mandate you will do this and you will have it done and you will pay for it and you'll have to find the money. Good luck. Now the hard part. PTC is a new technology. Yes, there's one PTC system in Michigan uh, that's been in existence for 10 years. It was basically developed for Amtrak. Uh, I happen to be project manager on that project. It's worked successfully for 10 years. I'm very proud of it, but it is a new technology. New nationwide standards are being developed by all of the people that you saw in these committees earlier. It's members of the railroad industry that are developing these nationwide standards. The freight application is well underway. Locomotives are having the equipment installed. Thousands of wayside signal system appliances have been installed. Train dispatching computer systems are being modified. And normally each railroad can do their own thing. Burlington Northern can do what they want on their railroad. Union Pacific can do what they want. Canadian National can do what they want. But now the system has to be interoperable between all of the railroads. 
So even though the locomotives must be fully capable of operating on their own railroad, now they have to be absolutely, completely capable of operating on everybody else's railroad. This is what we call interoperability, or remember the IETMS. Commuter railroads also operate across freight railroad tracks, so they have to be interoperable with the freight railroads that they run on. And if one can imagine that, you have to know where every piece of equipment is all the time, what version of software and hardware has been installed, what version of software wants to be installed, we have to be able to manage the configuration of millions of pieces of equipment. The schedule, each railroad is working dil diligently to install PTC on their own systems. The railroad industry has had to retain specialized employees and have hired thousands of new employees and contractors to assist with this deployment. Manufacturing wayside, locomotive, and back office equipment is proceeding to support installation. And each locomotive, wayside installation, and back office needs to have a completely new communications infrastructure developed from scratch. This must be completed by law by December 31st, 2015. It is a monumental undertaking. Um, I think that there will be some relief. We are hoping that's the case for a couple of years. It may be one year at a time, but we are proceeding today as if it must be done. And of course, it's not done yet. This is an unfunded mandate. The, the, the common principle is find your own money and get it done. And so I have two, two summary slides. Uh, about on the technical side, the, <coughs> honestly, uh, you know, I've worked in the industry for 37 years. The industry has devoted the best and the brightest to this effort. Thousands of employees, not only from the railroads, but with support from manufacturers and consultants in helping to make this initiative, uh, to install it, to test it, and make sure it works, to maintain it. It is extremely complex. It is a simultaneous undertaking by the entire railroad industry. The railroads are fierce competitors, but absolutely cooperate in a manner unprecedented I think in the United States. It involves all the major railroads, all the commuter railroads authorities, and some smaller railroads. And it requires billions of dollars of railroad funded investment. Now, my challenge to you, we need talented people. We cannot do these things on our own. The class one freight railroads need talented people. Regional railroads need talented people. Short lines and terminal companies, commuter rail agencies, Amtrak, consultants, manufacturers, suppliers. We can't do it without good people. I want to encourage undergrads and grad students to explore a myriad of technically and financially challenging opportunities in the railroad industry. It doesn't matter if you are interested in radios, you're interested in logistics, you're interested in marketing, you have a degree in law, doesn't make any difference. We need all of these people. We have a lot of people like me, a little older, looking forward to retirement. There's going to be a lot of, yeah, I'm real old, right? A lot of opportunity for people to take our place. And lo and behold, you know, you, you can have a good career. These are good jobs. They pay well. They have great benefits. And you will be exposed to and experience more things in many diverse area than you ever thought possible. For those that decide to join the rail industry, I promise you that whatever you think you're going to do, you will start. You will end up somewhere else. You will do something that you never thought possible. I think my career is starting out as a civil and doing all this stuff that I don't know or understand is a good testament to the fact that you can have a really, really wonderful career. So I hope that I've encouraged you to take a hard look at this industry it, as one of my friends says, it takes a, a ton of technology to move a ton of freight. And it's true, and we're doing a better job than we ever. It's a great industry. Please take a look at it in your careers, and we welcome you aboard with open arms. Dr. Larry, thank you. Don't be shy. All at once. Uh, hi. I'm, uh, I have a question about
about the uh, uh, chain active warning system. Uh, right now, uh, on on the track, the track uh, the active warning system is using the the track circuit to detect train. So I I wonder uh, after the positive train uh, control system is being used, uh, how to integrate the new system uh, to the the traditional warning system and uh, are they using together or and is there a transition period uh, to test these two systems? Let, let me try to answer that as, as good as I can. Um, the, there will be and always will be an existing signal system. The positive train control system is going to be, I call it icing on the cake. It's going to be an overlay system to the cake. It's going to be icing around the cake. Positive train control system will use the existing signal system as its roots. So that, that technology will always be there. PTC will take that technology and predict where the train is going to be. So it, it, and it will, through that prediction, it will enforce a safe stop if a train is going to <coughs> exceed. Today, there aren't many ways that we can stop a train before it reaches a stop sign or a stop signal. But positive train control will allow us to predict where that train is going to be if, if that train is going to stop in time and we will enforce braking so the train does stop in time. Okay, that, does that answer your first question? And I want to make sure that I address your second one. And the second one is? Uh. Oh, the mic. Um, the second one is, uh, uh, is there a transition period that, uh, to test this new system? Yes, but that's a good question. How, how do we transition this? Uh, each railroad has divided their railroad into smaller segments. We call them subdivisions. And they can be... 100 miles long, or they can be several hundred miles long, depending on the complexity of the individual railroad. Uh, each railroad will go out and they'll make sure that an individual interlocking, the switches and signals, or an intermediate location works. And they'll test it and test it and test it. And then they'll take a small subdivision and they'll turn it all on and make sure that it works. The difficult part is you can imagine an employee comes out is operating this big heavy train over a long distance and they see the normal regular signal system that they've seen for the last 20 years. Then we turn on this other switch, now we've got this new box on the locomotive that's telling them all kinds of stuff. So there will be a kind of a burn-in period okay, for each person to see and then at some point we'll make the decision on a railroad by railroad basis and a subdivision basis to throw the switch and then from that point on, positive train control is going to control the trains. So that's an excellent question. Uh, I would imagine that there are going to be in the neighborhood of maybe 500 of these times that we have different burn-ins throughout the United States. There are 50,000 locations which have to be tested before we can start turning on a subdivision. So yes, there's, there's two parts to that. One is the technical and the other is the human part. So it's an excellent question and it's going to take some time to do it and we still have to have it done in a very short period of time with many, many thousands of people. Excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, I'd like to ask a follow-up question uh, if I could on, on that. Um, uh, so I, I understand about the trains being in communication with, with each other. Is there going to be an ability to see that there's something stuck on the tracks at, at a grade crossing with this technology? Do you see that as being part of it? it I mean, we just had that, that accident in, uh, in West Texas, as an example. Positive train control is, is not designed in this rollout to detect a vehicle stuck on a track. It is not intended to do that. This is intended to keep trains from running into each other. Of course, what, we, what we're always trying to do is to educate the public and, and tell them that, no, don't drive through the gates, don't drive around the gates, and be careful when you're operating a motor vehicle over a grade crossing. The other thing that we're also trying to do is to eliminate grade crossings and trying to provide better warning protection or warning devices at each grade crossing, as well as um, enforcing 
the rules and, and there has to be a penalty for someone who drives around the gates. But in answer to your question, positive train control is not, this rollout does not address a vehicle stuck on the track. And then just to follow up on that, uh, it would seem to me that, the, you know, with all this technology we have, the smartphones and that, that there'd be an app for that. <laughs> Do you see that as being something that coming in where where the, you would allow this kind of information to go to commercial vehicle operators, trucks, school buses, ambulances that would, would know when there's a vehicle, or sort of train coming into the vicinity that had a great railway crossing. It's, a, it's an excellent question we were talking about this morning. There, there is uh, an effort underway um, with both the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Railroad Administration to look at exactly that. Uh, it's, it's still in the discovery, the concept period. By no means has it started to roll out or any kind of further uh, definition been provided. But what I ultimately think will happen is that the grade crossing will broadcast the message to a unit inside a vehicle. And, and it's like you know, the, the car, the, your, your seat vibrates when you back up. You know, some, some sort of a message will be given, whether it's a visual message and a visual audio or whatever that might be, that a train is approaching a crossing and you're getting too close and you better brake. I, I predict something like that will happen in the future. Uh, I had a quick question regarding the control. Uh, so the only control done right now is stopping the train or is it also you can slow down the train or, or change anything else or is it just stopping right now? That's, that's a good question. You remember the, the red line and the yellow line? We always want the locomotive engineer to be responsible to operate their train. For some reason, they're incapacitated. The yellow line gives that warning to the train crew that there's a problem and you better pay attention and do something. The red line is if they do nothing, the train will stop. So by providing not only the information on the screen that we saw, so that's kind of like, here's where we are, here's where we're going, maintain control of your train the right way, it just provides more information to the locomotive engineer. The yellow line that we saw provides a warning so that they can be proactive and do something before the brake enforcement comes in. The last resort, absolute last resort, is the brake enforcement. We always want the locomotive engineer to be in control of his or her train. Good question. Yeah, that quick question. How does one get an internship or a tour or what's the best way, if there's a student that says, you know, I really would like to see this facility, what's the best way to get in contact with them or to look at internship options or do they do that kind of thing? I'm sure that TTCI would always entertain internships. It's kind of a tough place to get to. We deliberately, we, um, the, the federal government and the AR, this, this place is positioned in the middle of nowhere on purpose. We don't want prying eyes driving out there and looking at things. And, and frankly, some of the things that we do are for customers, and they don't want prying eyes. So it's a difficult, difficult place to get to. But yes, I, I know that they would value internships. I'm sure by contacting TTCI, we can provide that information. Uh, the other thing, folks, is that I really encourage you to look at the different railroads, different commuter rail authorities, the passenger agencies, uh, also, if you're interested in the manufacturing or design of these things, consultants offer internships, manufacturers offer internships, and railroads do. So the entire industry, uh, we need talent, and uh, uh, it depends on company by company, but I'm sure that uh, we would embrace an intern. Tough jobs, tough jobs, but good jobs. Are there any other questions? Uh, just one, one more question on the uh, positive train control. Uh, actually, two. Um, the, the first one, it, it's a pretty big undertaking. Who owns the intellectual property? Is this like open source? Is this, does someone actually own the intellectual property? Could they sell it to other countries or other things like that? And then the second one is sort of related. Well, who has the liability on, on this side of things if, if something doesn't go quite right with it? Because it obviously is a very complex system. The railroads, <clears throat> two parts to that. Yes, there is intellectual property that's developed the, <clears throat> it's Wabtec that, that 
has and owns the, the box that they are manufacturing. These are developed to a standard. Same thing on the other side, the radio communication. There's proprietary information there. <clears throat> I don't see it. I don't want to see it. Don't want to know what's in it. Um, they own it. They can sell it. Okay. The railroads are also involved in the fact that they help create the standards so that if you wanted to open up a company, you certainly can do that. All you have to do is design and build your system to those standards. So it's open architecture from the standpoint of, yes, you have the right to compete, and the, and the, the standards and specifications are open for all, but, uh, yeah, you can believe that they have a lot of investment made in these a lot of these boxes that you see. And the same thing with the locomotive uh, suppliers, the same thing with other signal equipment suppliers. A lot of IP is out there. We have a question from our online audience. Curious if they hire international students as well as uh, permanent residents and US citizens. Good question. I can't answer it. I think it's on a company by company basis. But I'd certainly ask them. You know, I've never known them to. Uh, turn any talented individual away. We need talent. And one final question is, how is cybersecurity handled? You know, obviously all the radio transmission, you know, if the, if the box is open source and the architecture is standard, how is that being addressed by the railroad industry? I say a number of different op opportunities for terrorism and those kind of things with this environment. Yeah, the, the, <clears throat> the cybersecurity is a big deal. We actually have a real super secret network of communication that goes on between the railroads. Uh, when a railroad uh, is hacked or whatever, the, everyone is notified. Um, I know that there are encrypted messages that are going to be a part of this whole PTC process. If I tried to hack in, I couldn't. I don't think there's a way. I don't think it's worth trying. It certainly is not a research opportunity for someone to try to hack in. Uh, we have some of the best and the brightest security people who have been assigned to this, and uh, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that no one's ever going to be able to hack in. Uh, they've done a wonderful job of, of creating this source, and it's, it's created in such a way that you'd waste a lot of time trying to even entertain, trying to hack into it. I hope that answers it a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's pretty secret stuff, pretty high tech. Anybody have any other questions? <coughs> All right, we'll turn it over to Larry. Close up. Well, thanks, Bob. I appreciate that a lot. I think everyone enjoyed your talk. Um, uh, for the folks in Nebraska, we're going to have a dinner and you have a lunch. You'll have a chance to ask other questions and sure. do some follow up stuff. But, but again, thank you very much for coming out here and, and showing us this stuff. It was very interesting. It's, it's been a delight. Uh, this is a wonderful forum that you have. It, it simply, I'm not aware that it exists anywhere else. So. I know the railroad industry and I'm sure a lot of different industries appreciate just the opportunity to share some thoughts and to encourage people to join us. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Sir. Thank you.